Welcome to today's event. Today we get to talk about this new book. I love having props. Children of the Revolution, Violence, Inequality, and Hope in Nicaraguan Migration by Laura Enriquez. And um, this, is, this event is part of our series, Novedades Lanzamentos, New Scholarship at Berkeley, which highlights the work of Berkeley authors. And um, we're excited to kick off this series this semester with this event. Before we start, I wanna thank the class team who helped make this happen. So Janet, Greg, and Natalia Brizuela, our director who's not here right now. Um, thank you all. And I also wanna note, we've changed our name to class, which includes the Caribbean. So that's an exciting update and I will probably make a mistake when I say class. <laughs> but um, in a minute, I will hand you over to our speakers, all three of them, but first I'll start with introductions. Enriquez is Professor, Associate Chair, and Director of Undergraduate Studies in the Sociology Department at UC Berkeley. Her work circles around the possibility of transformation in Latin America. She's approached this interest through the lens of agriculture, including agrarian reform and food policy, as well as more general policies related to reproduction in this sector of the economy and for those who engage in it. Recently, brought in to explore how the lack of such change has led to migration from the region to Europe, which is what we get to hear about today. Her research sites have been Nicaragua, Cuba, Venezuela, and Italy, where she's engaged in interviewing and ethnography to study these topics. And Laura today is going to be in conversation with Margaret. Hi, Margaret. Um, who's professor and son chair in Latin American history in the Department of History at UC Berkeley. Her research focuses on Latin America, gender, women, church, in social economic history in Latin America. And there, and I also want to welcome Evan Fernandez, who's a PhD candidate in the Department of History also at UC Berkeley. His research looks at racial geographies and geospatial representation. He's interested in transnational history of Latin America, as well as the Pacific world. Well, that is all I'm going to say. And now I get to hand it over to you. Please join me in welcoming all three of our speakers. Thank you for that wonderful introduction and to all of you for coming out on such a warm day and, and being here with us and for you all for putting it together. It was the beginning of June of 2015. I had already left Berkeley for a year long sabbatical that I was planning to divide between Central America and Venezuela. What that sabbatical meant to me was finally being able to spend a lengthy period of time in Venezuela where I had been conducting field work for eight years, but just in little bits and pieces until then. I was working on the complicated and contradictory process of agrarian change underway there. And that project was quite in keeping with most of my research up until that point in time. While I was at my first stop, which was still here in the US, I was called away to a family emergency in Italy and that emergency kept me there. There are certainly worse places to be maroon, uh, but I was very anxious once the emergency calmed down. I was very anxious about the fact that I wasn't in my field and it was my sabbatical and I was uh, very, uh, I very much wanted to dive into research. Mid-2015 was a time of heavy immigration to Europe which was provoking a lot of controversy. Italy was one of the key points of entry for that, those waves of immigration. Coincidentally, I had entree to the Latin American immigrant community there through a group of Nicaraguan immigrant women. So I spoke with several Italian sociologists who said that the Latin American immigrant population was little studied and undertaking research on it would be a worthwhile endeavor. As a result, my research trajectory underwent a major shift to Latin American immigration to Europe, especially Italy. As I initiated my new project, I bore in mind C. Wright Mill's maxim that, quote, neither the life of an individual nor the history of a society can be understood without understanding both, end of quote. 
Hence, my research endeavor became collecting oral histories of the lives of the group of Nicaraguan immigrant women who I mentioned a moment ago. Not only would this give me the basis from which to tell their unique stories, but it would also allow me to speak to the long history of social change experienced by their country and what that had meant for the lives of the poor there. Nonetheless, I believe that their lives also provide a sketch of the many challenges that poor women all over Latin America, Latin America confront. That oral history project became the basis of Children of the Revolution. <laughs> Before telling you some of the elements of their stories, let me address the logical question which may be in your minds, which is, why focus only on women? Women happen to be the overwhelming majority of immigrants from Latin America to Italy in particular, but Europe in general. That's not true of all immigration to Italy. It varies by country, but in the case of Latin America, it's definitely women who are going and have been going throughout the long process, the long period of time that it has existed. All of the women whose stories I tell were from very poor backgrounds. The book starts by providing a window onto their childhoods, which took place in both rural and urban settings. They came from very humble abodes. In perhaps the most extreme case, as a child, one of these women, who I call Anna, participated in land occupations with her family on some of the country's large estates large plantations in the two years leading up to the overthrow of Anastasio Somoza, which occurred in 1979. Getting by was clearly a challenge for Anna's family. So Anna's mother and stepfather sought to attain some land to farm on their own, farm their own crops. As Anna recounted, right? After a few years, they decided to move. At that time, they were giving away land to poor people, you know. Interviewer question. So this was in the 1980s? No, it was before the 80s when people occupied land, remember? She then went on to say, we did this for some time, but afterwards, the Guardia, that is the National Guard, would arrive. They'd stay a little while, but then they'd throw us off the land and burn down our house. And we'd leave, you know, like the Sin Tierras. We'd go here and we'd go there. Over two or three years, we were in various places. I remember my mom was always with us. She'd take us along. We'd eat, we'd make huge pots of food, of rice. Everything was collective. Everyone who arrived would eat from the same huge cooking pot. For the kids, it was fun because it was entertaining. But for the adults, it wasn't entertaining. They lived in constant fear. The Guardia poisoned the water, poisoned the food. They burned the houses. We get word that the Guardia was coming that night to burn down our houses. And everyone would leave and sleep in the open. When we woke up in the morning, perhaps they hadn't come. And we'd go back to our little houses. Our houses were built of bamboo and branches of coconut palm. That's how we lived for some years. The book also describes the numerous obstacles the women encountered in trying to get an education, which in the case of Andre Andrea and her sister Sylvia involved living with their father's other family during the most intense months of the rainy season so that they could actually get to school. And then Andrea was given away as an hija de casa so that she could attend second grade. As she recalled, <laughs> I did second grade. I started it just before I turned 12 years old at the end of 1977. My parents told me that the following year I would be going away to school. They had given me as an hija de casa, that is an informally adopted daughter to this family, to Don Guillermo and to Doña Emilia, the owners of the haciendas my dad was the administrator of. 
I protested a lot because I didn't want to go. I had only seen this family from far off. And for me, they were untouchable. With us so low down and them so high up, I was to help them and they would allow me to study and give me what I needed. Slide. <laughs> she went on to say, I was there a year and then I escaped. When my parents told me I was going to help them, they didn't say I was going to work. And how I worked, I worked muchísimo. They had a huge store in addition to all the storage areas within the house. I went to school in the morning from 7 to 12, and I worked from 12 to 9 at night. I was great with managing the prices and everything, and so the work fell to me. I didn't study much. I didn't have time. They let me go home once a month. It was seven kilometers away. I felt as if I'd been given away. At work, it felt like forced work without pay. I wasn't happy there. And every time I went home, the senora would ask me if my mother had told me to steal things from their store. This only made me more resentful toward her because she didn't know my mom. My mom always said, I know you handle a lot of money and other things, and this gives you all kinds of possibilities, but don't take a cent of it. If you need a, a notebook, ask for it. Don't even take a pencil because they'll treat you like a thief. So at the end of the school year, I left and I went home. I, I left and I went home. Ultimately, because Andrea's parents had never obtained a birth certificate for her, she was unable to go beyond primary school. Not having a birth certificate was not entirely uncommon then, especially for those like Andrea, who had grown up in relatively remote areas and had fewer resources. Moving on, in several cases, the women's stories also included having experienced physical and sexual abuse as children. And the work lives of these women had not been easy. Several of them had only found employment as domestic workers, <laughs> and that meant being exposed to sexual harassment on multiple occasions. Again, the words of Andrea are extremely telling. Slide. Once I started my work life, which I say started when I was two, wherever I went to work, the male boss wanted something with me, or his sons wanted something, or the male friends of theirs who arrived. That is to say, I always felt harassed. Through the women's stories, we also become acquainted with the families their intimate relationships gave rise to. Likewise, they described what made the women decide to emigrate. For three of the four women, their partners were not contributing in any way to the expenses of raising their children. And as they looked toward the possibility of having to pay for their children to go to college, which none of these women had achieved, but which was one of their goals, they felt they had no choice but to leave Nicaragua and go where they could earn a higher salary. Finally, their stories shed light on what their lives in Italy have been like, including several of them having relatively smoother passage than most toward becoming documented, even as they found themselves being subjected to some level of discrimination, both at and outside of work, and being relegated to domestic work. And that work could be extremely arduous. Just to give you a sense of it, let me quote from one of my interviews with Sylvia. Slide, please. I had to be available 24 hours a day, practically speaking, because I lived with them. Well, I didn't actually live with them. They lived on the second floor of the building. Their mom lived on the first floor, and I lived in the basement. <laughs> They're people who like to go out at night a lot. So when they went out, I had to stay with the children. This is after working all day from 7 in the morning on. And when they went away on weekends to the mountains or to the sea, I had to go with them to take care of the kids. I had a day off every two weeks on Sunday. That is, if they didn't plan to go anywhere. Because if they had plans, I had to be available for them, either to stay with the kids 
or to go with them wherever they were going. In drawing from the oral histories with these women to write my book, I was firmly convinced that their histories provided poignant illustrations of the ways in which class, gender, racial, and immigration status, inequalities, which together give rise to structural violence, can impact the lives of ordinary people. On the other hand, all of the women came of age during the Nicaraguan Revolution, which lasted from 1979 to 1990. And their histories pointed to how that resulted in the consciousness of several of them being influenced regarding what they might aspire to for themselves and their children. That is, they could aspire to much more than their mothers had. The stories of these women also recounted the consequences of the neoliberal turn that followed the end of the revolution, as seen in Andrea's effort to get by relying on group microcredit that left her in debt for a very long time, and the challenges to find work faced by Pamela after taking the incentives provided to leave the government job she had held for some years. <laughs> Their stories also identify a pathway to emigration that was distinct from those commonly found in Latin America, which took the form of a group of Italian citizens who had moved to Nicaragua because of the revolution and stayed on subsequent to it. They put the women in touch with people back home who were looking for help that they could provide. The study also contributes to the discussion of the relationship between emigration and social mobility, showing that some mobility is possible, but not without caveats. In their case, several of their children had been able to attend college, which none of the women had, but because they were not from middle-class backgrounds, they lacked the social connections that were necessary to obtain professional work once they had their degrees. The book also takes the long view in terms of the efforts of these women to stay with their families in Nicaragua, despite the many adversities they'd experienced over the course of their lives that had resulted from those multiple inequalities. That is, they waited until well into adulthood to go abroad. And the book also shows how, at numerous points in time, they employed agency within the limited constraints that their lives permitted to lessen the impact of those inequalities. In concluding, let me say that several months into the project, I decided that I needed to interview, in addition, women from the larger population of Latin American immigrants, as well as representatives of organizations that worked with immigrants. So I began and have continued to interview a number of such representatives, as well as women who form part of the earliest waves of immigrants from that region who are from El Salvador, and from subsequent waves, including Peruvians, Ecuadorians, and so forth. Their history of migration will be the focus of my next book. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay, I guess I'm up. Um, <laughs> thanks, Laura, for writing this book and for doing something that I, I mean, I, we didn't discuss what you were going to uh present to the group, but I'm so delighted that you used so many of the quotes because that's one of the things that I wanted to highlight in my own comments. They're uh, just, the book is really built around these rich oral interviews um, because they're only four women. Um, I think you really get a rounded uh, picture of their lives. They're like uh, it's way more than prosopography as a a tool of of sociological analysis because you know so much about them and I think um, 
you really strive for what historians often strive for. I usually, I think of even more than sociologists, and that is a kind of rounded picture that takes a lot of factors uh, into account uh, that puts uh, class, as you said, sexual violence, gender, immigration status, and to a certain extent, race. That's not a, a big part of this book, but um, uh, somewhat versus other uh, approaches that might try to single out one of these factors or even single out two of them. It's as if you listened to what these uh, women were telling you in the interviews and the, and your your factors, your units of analysis arose out of those interviews, which is a kind of organic technique that a lot of times social scientists are um, frustrated with historians for, for thinking that way. So thank you for thinking that way, because it really is just a beautiful picture of these of these four women whom we really feel that we know by the time uh, the book is over. Um, to me, the the of, of all of those factors, the relationship between immigration status uh, and poverty or sexual uh, structural violence, which includes uh, class and poverty is uh, is probably stands out as the most important of those intersections. Um, and because in the end, despite the title Children of the Revolution, and I want to turn to the role of the revolution uh, in just a second, it seems to me the 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 sea changes in these women's lives came because of the opportunity to migrate and the reality of migration to Italy. And I also want to return to Italy uh, uh, towards the end. So this gives us a really powerful narrative. It's not just, you know, poor for the stories of four poor women in Nicaragua. There's a there's a, an overall narrative that links their lives and that gives this whole book a kind of dynamism uh, and movement that um, for just random biographies that ran taken from people at random uh, points in time wouldn't have had. So the other big event that gives the book um, structure and uh, raises questions about the causation, I guess, uh, is the 1979 uh, revolution. So the impact of migration in this book is uh, very evident um, and I think pretty clear, uh, super interesting, but, but very, very, unambiguous. Uh, the role of the revolution is way more elusive. Um, on the one hand, as you recounted briefly in your presentation, it's clear that these women and others gained benefits from the revolution. And during the decade of the revolution is the decade in which they came of, of age. And the the kinds of benefits that women coming of age in the 1980s would have received seem pretty compelling to us, but I think they have to seem compelling uh, in this book more in the abstract than in the quotes. I mean, all of all of the wonderful quotes that give us such depth of insight into these women they almost never say, you know, I really benefited from the childcare or I benefited from um, the, the the hope that the revolution gave me. Um, that's, that's, we, we are certain that that happened, but we're not getting direct evidence from their words. And instead, they pretty persistently claimed that the revolution was not the most important thing, that it was their own hard work or bad luck or good luck that determined their fates. Um, this isn't actually uh, surprising, uh, doesn't surprise me that people see their lives as mainly contingent and they see their lives as having themselves at the center of their lives, which is, seems like such an obvious statement, but um, they themselves are the agents of change. Uh, so even 
people like us who are intellectual, trained in sort of understanding intellectually that there's structure and agency or structure and contingency and keeping those things in balance in our own work, in our own lives, we might be tempted to do the same thing. I mean, for example, I was I was thinking about this as I was reading the book. I think that if someone asked me, how did you uh, come to have a position as a professor at, at UC Berkeley? I think I would credit second wave feminism with its demands for equal representation in the academy for some of my social mobility in the academic world, maybe a lot of it. But the more you talk to me, the more the stories I told would feature the things that happened to me. Um, I, I did this, I did this well, I didn't do this well, I survived this uh, harassment. I use, you know, it was, it's, it's, it's my story. And the stories that I would tell if I were being interviewed by someone like you would be, I, I think I would feel pedantic saying it was second wave feminism, even though it, it might uh, have been. So how do you handle this in a book? And here I really have to credit Laura with um, a, a great job. Uh, she's very honest about what the women are uh, telling her, but she calls attention to uh, the positive structural changes that the revolution brought, and I think is very judicious in your evaluation of, um, of where, the, where the causation in whatever measure of social mobility these women and their children achieved uh, came from. Um, I do want to say one thing in addition, sort of in the realm of gender, um, and especially motherhood, uh, there's a couple of um, simplistic tropes about absent mothers. One, they're bad mothers. <laughs> Two, they're at, like the women in this book who are very clearly loving mothers who uh, leave their children. Um, and And by the way, they don't all leave all of their children, but they... They leave their children in order to be able to um, to hopefully Im improve their children's lives with the money that they earn uh, overseas. And here, I think this this is where you have to come back, I think, to the fact that there are four stories here. So there's a kind of critical mass. It's not just one story, but four is a small enough number that we can see the varieties of ways that this was anguishing for the mothers, uh, but also um, something that they did out of out of love and that they did with uh, with thought, as you mentioned in your presentation, the timing of the de decision to go overseas did have to do with uh, their own feelings about where their children were in life and what you know, when it was kind of more okay, I guess, to leave them. I mean, some of them may have misjudged that slightly, but uh, that's, um, there was there was no question from the answers they gave to you that this was something that, uh, that they thought about. And uh, to conclude, I want to um, just comment about the difference between the Italian state's attitude towards immigration and our own country's attitudes towards immigration. The, the people who employed um, the these women, uh, prob probably the ones in Nicaragua were self, a self-selected group to be um, progressive minded and to pay their nannies and their housekeepers decent wages because they'd come there during the revolution in order to um in order to help Nicaragua achieve a, a meaningful revolution. So but once these once these women get to Italy, the you know the 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 way their employers treated them varies a lot. But one thing is constant, they had good wages 
uh, I was kind of astonished at the wages that they were earning. And they were also had protections from the state, paths to citizenship, uh, paths to social security. I can't even remember all the other ways that I was just kind of blown away by what a what a humane system this is in a country that you you attribute to the fact that it is a care economy, that it needs daycare and it needs elder care. But I mean, so do we. <laughs> we need elder care and daycare more with every year that we baby boomers get older, right? And um, so, and yet nothing like that is happening in, in this country. So I just have to I, I just have to call out Italy and give a shout out to Italy in the Italian state. I don't know whether maybe you can comment, Laura, you didn't say that things had tightened up or gotten bad more recently. It's entirely possible with the migration from Northern Africa that things have deteriorated there. But at the time of this book, I was pretty, pretty, pretty taken by that. <laughs> All right, I'll yield to Evan. Thank you. Great. Great. Thanks, Margaret. Um, so I think I'll do something similar where I am going to summarize a little bit of what I thought were the big takeaways from the book. I have some points of praise that I want to make sure are particularly clear. And I'll try to be brief, be brief but I figured that since I'm the last person, I'm, I'm deliberately concluding with some questions that I think should pivot us into conversation. Maybe three of us are hopefully with the audience as well. Um, uh, and, and, and I'll say I appreciate the invitation to participate because, as I said beforehand, I'm a historian of South America, meaning that my opportunities to talk about Nicaragua are few. So it's, it, it's particularly fun to be able to talk about this book. Children of the Revolution narrates the lives of four Nicaraguan women, Andrea, Silvia, Ana, and Pamela, from their childhood through the triumph of the Sandinista Revolution in 1979, through their adulthood and eventual parenthood over the subsequent several decades. Despite the opportunities that socialist revolution was supposed to deliver to Nicaragua, these women ultimately decided at different times and for somewhat different reasons uh, that better futures relied upon uh, salaries uh, that they could remit and earn abroad rather than remain in Nicaragua. And so for these reasons, um, these actors eventually uh, emigrated to Italy and worked within what Enriquez describes as the Italian care economy. And the salaries uh, from these jobs financed, uh, as, as Enriquez mentioned, uh, for at least some of them, their children's education and enabled the next generation um, to access, I, I, I think, certain privileges and certain professional careers that were out of the question uh, for Andrea, Silvia, Ana, and Pamela when they themselves were young people in the 1960s and 70s. So en Enriquez illustrates how these women were able to both exert some agency on the structures around them, such as uh, we talked about social mobility, physical mobility by emigrating to Italy, um, accessing higher salaries, being able to care for their children. But they also struggled against, at times, seemingly insurmountably difficult structural inequalities of gender, race, and class. <laughs> and so echoing what Margaret said, I was particularly impressed with how Enriquez moves so fluidly between these um, these scales of gender, race, and class. I myself am trying to work on this in my dissertation, and it's quite difficult to do. Um, but the way that you move in and between these scales um, is fantastic. And I think there's almost another scale when it comes to talking about structural inequalities, and that's almost geography in that these scholars are, or excuse me, these actors are coming from a relatively poor country in the 1970s that was embroiled in significant social conflict and civil war. And that also impacted how they were treated when they arrived in Italy. So I think that's another element um, of structural discrimination. And I, I, I appreciate how Enriquez places all of these, these scales, gender, race, class, under a broader category of structural violence. Because um, it's compelling how she illustrates that violence, structural violence, is not just uh, physical or sexual abuse, and there is quite a bit of that, but it's also these kind of insurmountably difficult uh, structures of inequality, sy systemic inequality. 
Um, so I think moving between those scales was an important takeaway for me and a, and a strength of this book. Um, I want to briefly say that I, I think chapter four stuck out to me. So if the early chapters are about their childhood and coming of age, uh, chapter four, I'm a transnational historian. I work on international topics. So I think it stuck out to me because chapter four is the emigration chapter. It's when they, it's when they go to Italy. And uh, what I think is significant is Enriquez's treatment of the decision and the mechanics of emigration. I also study emigration in a way. And it's often talked about as before and after or here and there as if it's kind of a binary state. But Enriquez illustrates that leaving and emigrating is not a simple decision that one can actualize at any moment. Not only is it um, emotionally very difficult leaving behind one's family, but it's also logistically quite difficult in that all of these actors, it took them years in many cases to find tolerable working situations and it required logistically speaking networks of intermediaries to work out and so uh the kind of complexity of making that decision really comes out in that chapter um in addition to what margaret said with the smooth um transitioning between your own prose and the really rich sources i thought it was really compelling um, okay, and the, the last thing I'll say, before, uh, um, sort of my summary and praise before I get to the questions, is that, well, I should say, I'm not, I myself, I'm not a gender historian, um, I, so I can't claim to have done a lot of original thinking on these topics, but uh, I've studied a lot of gender history, taught to me by uh, Margaret Chowning, who is one of the foremost historians of gender in Latin America, and my takeaway from my study of this scholarship is that gendering our approaches, you know, what does that mean? I think it's not just about filling holes in historical narratives with actors who are typically overlooked, mm -hmm. such as um, these, these, these women from poor backgrounds in Nicaragua. I think that's a significant contribution is bringing actors into the center of a narrative who were often excluded. But I think there's something deeper that Enriquez accomplishes in this book. Um, and here I take a cue from gender historian Aisha Finch, who's a big um, gender historian um, in the Caribbean. She's got some important work on the Caribbean. And she argues that um, gendering our approaches, the payoff of that is not just about um, bringing in new actors, but it's using a gendered lens as a way of understanding larger historical processes. And I think Enriquez does exactly that in using a gender lens to help us understand uh, more about the Nicaraguan revolution, the act of migrating, um, these questions about discrimination and structural violence. So I, I think I was particularly compelled and appreciative of, I think the payoff in terms of gendering our analysis of understanding the broader phenomena <laughs> in addition to learning more about these actors themselves who probably have not been included in scholarly accounts before. Yeah. Um, okay, so that's that's kind of my summary and takeaway. And I wanna conclude um, with a few questions. If you wanna answer them, that's great. If not, that's great. We can talk about it. Hopefully um, some folks from the audience will, will chime in. So I'm curious to know about the whether or not you think these four actors are exceptional or typical. So one question is, are, the, are these four women and their experience, are they exceptional or were there other actors from similar backgrounds <laughs> who took similar paths of emigrating and remittances and, and sending remittances? Um, if these actors are exceptional or if they are representative of a larger population, does that influence any of these theoretical conclusions? Um, Another quick question about exceptionality, uh, Margaret touched on this when talking about the revolution, is that if, 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 if you argue that the revolution kind of impacted their con actors' consciousness of what was possible, was that specifically about the Nicaraguan revolution or could this apply to any Latin American context? So for example, if you were to take four actors from a similar background in, uh, say Cuba in the 1960s, Chile in the early 1970s, Peru in the 1980s or 90s, all places that were similarly undergoing civil war and having Marxist revolutions that were ostensibly about bringing more social equality. 
could the stories of these four actors have played out there or could it have just been a Nicaraguan story? Um, and then I, I, I maybe wanted to ask a question about um, structure versus agency, but I think that might come up in our conversation afterwards. So I'll finish with this. Um, and I think this is, I deliberately finished with this question because it's a compelling one. And I think one that uh, could be particularly generative for conversation, but it's, so, so I really enjoyed this book. I thought it was a great book. Um, I appreciated reading it, but I've thought a lot about it and I can't decide. Um, I can't decide if I think this is a hardening story about perseverance and overcoming of structural barriers, or if it's kind of a discouraging story and, or pessimistic story in that despite gaining or despite having some agency to improve their lives and their children's lives, these actors are still constrained by really severe and unfair structural inequalities. So I couldn't decide if I thought this was optimistic or pessimistic. Um, maybe, I mean, maybe it doesn't matter to make an argument about that, but I think that could be kind of an interesting question for us to chew on. So um, I think we have a lot and we can take it from there. Thank you. Okay. Thank you both. Thank you both for very much for your kind, generous comments. I appreciated them immensely. Uh, shall I take a few minutes to respond? Yes, and then I'll, we will allow time for our two readers to see if they want to say anything else and then open it up. Does that make sense? Yes, yes, yes. Great. So let me respond to a few different things that were mentioned by Margaret and Evan. I tried very hard, given that I heard about the material things these women received during the revolution and as a result of the revolution, including land, uh, including a whole variety of things, I tried <laughs> very hard in multiple ways to see if they would identify the different position their children are in now as having been produced by the revolution or what else? I didn't say, was it the revolution? I said, what do you think all the difference between your children's lives in contrast to your own was due to? And try as I might from as many angles as I could, it was the immigration story that, from their point of view. Not the revolution. That explained it, absolutely. Now, they certainly acknowledged the many things that they received from the revolution, but not in the context of explaining how it was that their children are in a different position than they ever were, and that their children have been able to do much more than they ever were. So they didn't make those linkages, and in fact, uh, asking more about the times and the difference between now and earlier. Um, they just really talked a lot. I should acknowledge that there were differences, as Margaret pointed out, between them, too, in terms of the extent to which they talked about um, uh, having their consciousness modified. There were clear differences between them. These were not um, Sandinista militants. Um, they engaged a bit in, in activities that were happening in the 1980s, but were not, I wouldn't say were overly involved. There again, there was a range between them. Uh, one took part in the popular militias some of the time, um, and another didn't seem to have uh, participated in any way, which I thought was good to have that variability. I was pleased by that variability. So, but they were they were not carrying card carrying Sandinistas, yet they clearly received a variety of material benefits, and to some extent, it impacted their consciousness, but not to the point where they identified the revolution as being responsible for their children being in a fundamentally different position than they were. Let me say about the Italian state, you're absolutely right that it is fundamentally different from the US state. I learned a lot about that that I didn't know during that period of time that I was stuck there. 
uh, and from the women that I interviewed. Um, things are definitely changing. I even heard about changes at that point in time. So my sense is that earlier in history, not necessarily vis-a-vis -vis immigrants, vis-a-vis -vis immigrants, things were harder earlier on. But the, the welfare state was a stronger welfare state earlier on for Italians. Vis-a-vis -vis immigrants, at least through the period of time that I was doing most of these oral histories, uh, um, things were uh, quite good. Quite, the one, um, one institution which uh, neither of you mentioned, which was really striking, is that they have access to unions. In, and they are represented by unions and they go to the unions to get assistance vis-a-vis -vis employers. What a concept, you know, would they, is that even imaginable here? To say nothing of there being as straightforward, straightforward may, is a bit strong, um, but a, a clearer path to documentation than has existed here and to hold a variety of rights that come with that in terms of access to health care and public health care, et cetera. Nonetheless, there is a very um, far right government in power in Italy now and immigration since the period of time in which I was doing the bulk of these oral histories has increased so massively in the Italian Italy and the Italian state is so overwhelmed with the weight of this immigrant population without the financial resources or even uh, bodies as then forming part of the state to deal with them, that conditions are not quite as positive, I think, uh, for immigrants as they were, say, um, five to 10 years ago. The, including as a consequence of the war in Ukraine. Italy has been overwhelmed, as is true with much of Europe. Okay, to get to Evan's questions, wonderful questions, where to start? Um, I think the last two, oh, so I'll, I'll, I'll address two of them. One is how typical uh, are these actors? And can they, could equivalents be found elsewhere in Latin America? I thought your selection of cases was quite telling because you pointed to cases where large scale social change has taken place as opposed to just mm -hmm. other countries where it has not, which is true of most of Latin America. And I would say, yes, probably a number of these dynamics would could be found, uh, dynamics and uh, responses and similar kinds of action are typical, would be typical of countries where large scale social changes taken place. However, especially around gender, the point in time in which the Nicaraguan revolution unfolded is quite different than when the Cuban revolution unfolded or the the three years of uh, Chile under Allende. And so the struggle around women's rights was also very different. And that made for a different context in which to talk about what women could do, what they were entitled to, et cetera. So I would say yes and no. I do want to make the case though, and I spoke to this a bit in my earlier comments, that I think their general level of, um, of being impacted by all kinds of inequalities, uh, especially class, gender, and gender to a lesser extent, but to a certain extent, racial as well, that can be found throughout much of Latin America. Um, the kinds of circumstances, especially in the period of time in which they were growing up, um, uh, the circumstances in which they grew up, et cetera. Finally, to get to the last question, and I'm hoping that the two of you may have some comments about this. Is this a heartening story or a 
discouraging story. Now, the second word is not yours, it's mine. And I just was because I missed, I didn't write down the word you used. Pessimistic. Pessimistic. I think this is clearly related to the, the issue of structure versus agency. It's, it's essential, or I really wanted to make the point that they engaged in agency in many, many, many ways, including leaving the circumstances, the horrific circumstances of physical and sexual violence that they experienced as children. They experienced agency um, at multiple other moments in time, including emigrating. But they, their agency, their possibilities for movement were not unlimited. The, the, all of the multiple structures of inequality that that characterized the society in which they lived and which they went on to live in in Italy were real. And there was no completely escaping them. So it was this back and forth dynamic between all of the 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 oppression that came with those inequalities and their struggles to to try and break out of those inequalities and there again there were differences between the women in the extent and the the means the ways in which they struggled against those inequalities any comments or reactions you want to say something, Margaret? Uh, yeah, I don't think I don't think it has to be in in either or. I mean, it's got elements of both. I mean, that sounds like sort of a cop out, which is why I sort of hesitated jumping in. I think saying it in that way, um, it reduces the impact of of the book. I would say you read the book. The audience should go out and buy the book, and they should read it because the there is both of those things: the encouraging and uh, pessimistic structure and agency are 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 just both present. And I just think they're handled very well and by by um, Laura. Yeah, um, I would agree. And so I, I have a couple of things. I'm going to come back to this question in just a second. But I appreciated your response about whether or not these actors were exceptional or typical. Because, and, and you said in your brief remarks at the beginning that your next project is about a broader uh, cohort of actors. So I'd be, I'll, I'll be very curious to hear what you have to say um, and kind of the national origins uh, or the nationalities of those new actors and whether or not you know, compared to this sample size, whether or not the story is typical or exceptional. So I think stay tuned um, for the next book. Um, yeah, I think I think you're both right that it doesn't have to be either or. Um, and one one offshoot from that, um, and if anyone has thoughts on this, <laughs> if if part if, if if part of the answer, part of the way that we should think about this is this question of agency or structure. I'd be curious to hear what you think the role of um, intermediaries are in the question of structure or agency. Because I like I agree that I think as individuals, they could be, you know, they were the actors. They were the ones doing doing the acting and, and creating change in their lives and, and, and for those around them. But in a lot of instances, these actors. Uh, for different reasons and in different ways, had to rely on pretty significant networks of intermediaries in order to emigrate in the first place, um, in order to find employment when they got to Italy, or many of them finding when, when they initially found uh, uh, employment that was pretty exploitative or intolerable, they relied on other social contacts in order to find something else. So, yeah, what... Um, what what is the role of intermediaries in the question of structure and agency? Should should I respond or should we open it up to other questions? Yeah, respond out okay. Out. All right. I think other uh, assistance from others of a whole uh, array of types uh, was critical. 
So I'm I'm just thinking of, for example, in the case of at least two of the women who experienced uh, sexual and physical violence, they looked to other people to get them out of their um, tremendously oppressive situations. One looked to an older sister uh, who effectively uh, used the excuse of needing her help mm -hmm. to um, to have her come and live with the older sister and get her out of the home environment that was so problematic. <laughs> the other looked to an aunt and said, please find me work. I need a job. And the point was the job would take her away from that home environment that was so problematic. So those weren't even foreign actors. They were simply others who could assist them in the process of leaving. But they did take the initiative to, to leave. Um, foreign actors were critical uh, for the immigration they um, engaged in. One of them said quite explicitly, I would... I'm a coward. I would not, I'm I'm paraphrasing now. I don't remember the exact quote. I'm a coward. I would not emigrate illegally. So she wouldn't have gone on her own, as as we see so many people actually doing who are engaging in it on her own. So she was invited to go on the multiple occasions on which she went. So intermediaries were certainly critical. Whether it was in the big leaps to for international migration or leaving her home and going to uh, live in the capital, what, um, uh, having others in their lives who would assist them was certainly important, certainly important. Nonetheless, they did take those steps yeah. and they might not have. Yeah. And, and in many cases, I, th I think there's one um, I think that's a great answer. I, I wish I'd written this quote down because I don't remember which exact actor it was. Um, I had some quotes. I may be able to tell, maybe you. to tell me. It was a situation where she'd been with a family. She'd been working in the domestic care role uh, with, with a family who hadn't, who owed her like two weeks of pay and they wouldn't pay her. And I think the, um, like the, the head of household had been very rude to her. But then I think her husband. This is in Italy. This is in Italy, yeah. This is Pamela. Okay, well, it's, it's Pamela, that's right. And so Pamela was going to leave this family and, and find employment elsewhere, but the husband was able to like contact her on the side and did give her the payment that she was owed, but then she did, she decided not to stay in that structure anyway. Right. So I think that's a good example of right. you're, you're reliant kind of both on some sort of intermediary, but then you ultimately make the decision for right. yourself. Absolutely. Yeah, that's Pamela. Okay. Absolutely. Right. Yes? Yeah, no, I just wanted to make a... Uh, a comment. Um, first of all, thank you so much for your book. Uh, I started reading it. I haven't finished it. I hope I will finish it and then reach out to you. Um, as a Nicaraguan, I think uh, you know having the history of four Nicaraguan women is narrated in that way. I mean, at least for me, it was compelling. And I just wanted to add in that sense that maybe um, a layer of analysis for further research in that sense regarding the questions you had about the role of the revolution in the agency of these women. And I think the reason, this is just you know my assumptions, is, is as a Nicaragua who grew fed up of the uh, Sandinista revolution for many reasons. My father and fought in the, in the Sandinista revolution. And my mom also went to the national literacy uh, campaign. Uh, but I think, one of the reasons it, it, that might happen is because maybe it's time to move from this um, narrative of mysticism mm -hmm. that surrounds the Sandinista revolution and start seeing it as a movement that has its political nuance, its complexities, uh, that it was a social movement that went beyond uh, a political party mm -hmm. because there were different uh, political sectors involved in, mm -hmm. during that area. And actually, the episode that triggers all the social revolt to the highest levels of violence is actually the, the assassination of a, I wouldn't say a right uh, uh, wing leader, 
but it certainly wasn't like the <laughs> the the best ally uh, of of uh, of the Sandinistas. So um, I think the stories of, of of these women talk about you know the necessity of the importance of seeing how individuals in that time, uh, not only in Nicaragua but in Central America, because because of all the social mm-hmm. turmoil that happened in, during that time. Uh, we're navigating through these complexities between what was promised and what actually happened. Mm-hmm. And having, you know, <laughs> at least for me, it's really interesting to understand migration on that time because 40 years later, again, with a Sandinista uh, regime or the Sandinista government, we are experiencing, you know, waves of migrations mm-hmm. and difficulties and this type of thing. So, um, yeah, I just wanted to highlight that. Mm-hmm. Maybe it could add some more mm-hmm. uh, to the comments and to the and to the inquiries uh, mm-hmm. for further uh, analysis. Mm-hmm. But I really, really appreciate the way, at least the, what I've read thus far, I really appreciate how it was okay. written and how it was uh, honored, uh, the voices. And I could feel like I was, you know, uh, in those occasions, uh, was when, when I was reading it. So thank you so much. For that. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you. Yeah, I had. Uh, I, I look forward to reading the book. I haven't uh, read it yet, uh, but I, I was just wondering. Uh, maybe this is previewing what you're what you're working on now. Is whether um, uh, that how the, these four women, Nicaraguan women, compared to other Central American women who were in in Rome, and particularly or wherever they were in Italy, and particularly those, for example, Salvadorans who lived in FMLN controlled areas or Guatemalans that were you know, part of the, in the villages, Namaya, for example, where there are similar experiences of agency writ large uh, for those women who were visible or, or discernible in your interviews. And maybe that is an, an, a factor which, you know, is independent of sort of nationality, though God knows everybody in Central America, Nicaraguans are different from the way that Salvadorans function, or the way that Guatemalans and Hondurans or Ticos function. I can certainly <laughs> speak with with you about that. Um, I have found the earliest um, Latin American immigrants to uh, Italy were Salvadorans, and they had they were the largest population there until well into the eighties. Uh, women. <laughs> Men started to arrive in the 80s because of the war in El Salvador. They started to bring their sons, brothers, husbands, etc. But until then, it was women, and women are still the majority. The Salvadoran community in Italy, and I, my research is in northern Italy because that is where the majority of Latin Americans are. Northern Italy is significantly wealthier than Southern Italy, so there's more work there um, because they work with wealthier families, uh, among other reasons. Um, The Salvadoran community in uh, Italy is amazingly well organized to the point that they have their own church uh, with their own service in in Spanish, and they engage in many, many different kinds of activity, both directed at other immigrants as well as in sending aid home. But for example, during um, the the lockdown, as they refer to it, uh, due to COVID in Italy, the Salvadorans were really critical in uh, providing all kinds of assistance to undocumented Latin Americans, more broadly speaking, who were not permitted. If you weren't documented, you couldn't get permission to go out on the street. And any movement, even walking on the street, was controlled during the lockdown in Italy once they realized that they made a big mistake early on. Uh, once they got past that moment, the lockdown was very serious. You needed permission to even go to the store or to even go to the pharmacy. And if you were not documented, you couldn't get permission, which meant you couldn't work. So how were you supposed to survive? And the Latin American community put together uh, an effort to uh, provide aid of all kinds to um those Latin Americans who were undocumented and Salvadorans formed a critical part of that uh, effort. 
The next big wave of immigrants from Latin America were Peruvians. They remain the largest Latin American population in Italy, followed by Ecuadorans. The Peruvians started coming in the 80s, and they came in huge numbers in the 90s. That's when they surpassed the, the Salvadorans. Uh, but from what I have been able to see, they are nowhere near as organized as at the base level as the Salvadorans are. Um, and they're, they seem to be much more divided. Um, an, a, a very interesting contrast, which is not so surprising that I've, I've identified between the different groups. So I've interviewed people from Argentina up to Mexico. Um, not every single country in Latin America, but most of Latin America. Uh, it is that the South Americans by and large, not each and every one of them, but the South Americans by and large came from much more advantaged backgrounds. Um, so they attained higher levels of education. There were clearly more resources in their households and a number of them had attained professional jobs. So they had college degrees and they are they uh, were working in professional capacities. They get to Italy and they all end up working in the same sector because that's where they are able to get employment. And, and employment is essential if you're going to be documented. And they know, most of them know ahead of time that that is where they're going to end up working because it's not uncommon knowledge. Uh, but they, nonetheless, they still leave their countries. They, the point in time in which most of them have left has, depending on the country, is the precise moment varies, but it's economic crisis, it's political crisis, it's armed conflict, et cetera, that's driving them out. And not to say that no one has escaped staying in the domestic labor sector, but almost all of them have landed there and spent a considerable period of time there. And my findings are similar to findings of others that only a very small percentage make it out of that sector of employment, regardless of the variation in background that they had before they left their country of origin. I want to make sure we get to an online question. So I'm going to read this um, from, from Leslie Salzinger. I haven't yet read the book, but I'm looking forward to it. So that said, I'd like to follow up with what Margaret said and ask Laura to think out loud about what you think of the impact of living through the revolution, what it did for these women's sense of what was possible or due to them or not, whether or not they narrated it in that way and then how you understand the relationship between their narratives and your analysis of that impact. One woman of this group was quite explicit in saying that she, she was not a regular attendee in, um, at the feminist organization that was active at that point in the 1980s. However, she did go occasionally to uh, meetings there and she said that she heard for the first time in her life that women could do anything that men could do. And that was sort of an incredible concept. She never, that, that had never occurred to her before. She, and she went so far, this is in response perhaps to the gentleman who's not, the Nicaraguan man who's not here anymore. But she went so far as to say, we were told we could do anything and we had all the rights of men, et cetera. None of that, or that did not actually reach fruition. That did not actually totally occur to, to respond to him. So she was acknowledging both that she heard these incredible ideas, but that they, they never were fully realized. Um, and nonetheless, they were, if you compare her mother's life, her mother had something like, um, I'm not remembering now, maybe either Margaret or Evan will. Her mother had something like 12 children. <laughs> this woman has two. And that has made for a completely different experience. Her mother was forced to stay with 
uh, the father of most of those 12 children, despite the fact that he had another family and had 10 children with that other family at the same time and was abusive in many ways, including to the children. Um, so her mother clearly felt she had no alternatives. Nonetheless, her daughters felt like they did have some alternatives, not to say that their relationships were all ideal relationships, the ones that they went on to have as young adults and then adults, but certainly they've lived a totally different life than their mothers did um, and have not had to suffer through many of the things that their mothers did. Thank you. I want to share one more question from um, our audience online. And this, I'm combining two different people's questions. They're asking about the differences in the experiences of the migrants. And Lisette Dolan is asking about differences based on phenotype, light or dark skin, if you have any comment about that. And then Yu Tian Singh is asking about differences um, in the experiences of married migrants versus single mm -hmm. versus mothers. So I would ask, married when? Married in their home country or married in Italy? Um, but let me, because they're both dynamics um, I have found and seen. Um, what I've already lost the first question. Just remind me quickly of the color. skin color. Absolutely. Absolutely. So to the extent that these women talked about discrimination and gave me examples of discrimination, one being one of the four women who is discussed in this book, uh, she described going up to a woman on the street and asking for directions. And the woman saying, get away from me, just leave me alone, get away. All she did was ask for directions on the street. And the woman said, get away from me, get away. This woman who is among the four is quite dark skinned. And I am quite sure that if the, the woman who was from abroad uh, was significantly lighter skinned, the reaction would have been different. I've never experienced a reaction like that myself, ever, in my various stays in Italy. I'm treated totally differently than immigrants. I, I was an immigrant myself there, um, uh, to treated totally differently if I made a mistake on my train ticket, uh, et cetera. Uh, skin color makes a huge difference in Italy, as it does in Nicaragua. And um, the second question now was? Single, married. Uh, ah, okay. <laughs> well, women who have were married in their home country, um, uh, I'll talk about the, the Latin American, the group of Latin American women as a whole. Typically, the women went first. In one case, uh, uh, a Peruvian family I'm familiar with, um, who I interviewed, the man went first, but that, that was really an exception. And as with all of the immigrants, it takes quite some time for them to be able to bring their other family members. Typically, they have to be able to document that they have a living circumstance that the that is sufficient, sufficient uh, for them to be able to support their family and live uh, in, a, in a way that Italian authorities accept and an income that will sustain a family. So they typically bring their family members in a staggered fashion. Um, sometimes um, that has resulted, and I'm thinking more about when men have gone first in women effectively being left behind as the men form new families in Italy. Um, have, can I think of a case where it went the opposite direction? No, it's been more the men forming new families in Italy. Now, a number of the women, in, including in this group of four, formed relationships with other Latin Americans in Italy. Now the struggle is if they're going to go home when they retire, Where's home? Their husbands or their partner's country or their own? Um, 
And some of them have formed relationships, partnerships, marriages with Italian men, not the majority, but a number of them have. And that has opened up the possibility of receiving there are different kinds of pension in Italy. Anyone who works in Italy, if you don't earn enough mon money when it comes time to retire, you haven't been able to save a lot, you're entitled to a social pension. Uh, but if you have been able to earn a reasonable amount, you'll get your ordinary pension, like our social security. Uh, with marriage to an Italian, um, the immigrants have access to more in the way of pensions and uh, an easier path, not an automatic path, but an easier path to citizenship. Let me just go back a step, though, and say um, among the four women uh, who the book is about, one has achieved citizenship, and she was not married to an Italian. It was by length of time that she had lived in Italy <laughs> thus far. And so that path, as Margaret pointed out, is very different than what would be possible in the U.S., certainly. That it was, a, it, took a, it took a while, but it was a straightforward process due to the fact that she had lived and worked in Italy X number of years. She now has citizenship. Oh, sorry, I was. I think we're going to end it, but we can continue the conversation in this room. I know you had another question. Um, so I want to say thank you very much. Thank you to everyone who connected. Thank you to Laura, thank you to And thank you to the folks who commented. I appreciate it immensely, and to all of you who were responsible for organizing this event.